coming. I mean, so we're going to kick off the afternoon session. Just a few logistical items. Please continue to share on social media, hashtag DSS uh, NYC and at Data Sci Salon. Um, Anna's team will uh, retweet that and re-channel uh, it across the across that her network. Um, so I'm very happy to announce the afternoon session, which is a, an amazing set of panelists really talking about the top trends driving value for machine learning applications in banking and finance. We have really amazing speakers, uh, amazing panels. Uh, first, really, Harry Mandel from the Federal Reserve, uh, Ben Clayman, basically from Square, uh, Aaron Stanton from Virtue Financial. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> JT Putenda from Fitch Ratings. Uh, so we, we, you know, we're okay, right? <laughs> SMP, you know, Moody's, Fitch, yeah, so good. <laughs> we're friends. <laughs> um, Nikhil Sendev from uh, Insight Partners, and our moderator, Jonathan Sheikh from Grant Thornton. Um, without further ado, please go ahead. Yep. Yeah. Well, welcome, everyone. Thank you very much. Yeah, we pass all the microphones. Uh, nice to meet everyone. My name is Jonathan David Chai. I um, come all the way from Houston, Texas. Uh, I do live in New York, but I also, I have to say this, I come from the Big Easy city of New Orleans, Tulane University. Um, so I, I, a little bit about me as we get acquainted. We have a great panel of uh, folks here that will be talking to us about the top trends driving value with machine learning applications. Um, I guess one of the reasons why I was chosen to be a, a moderator is because I, I sit at the intersection of data science and verifying data models and banking and financial services um, projects. So I'm very happy to be here with you guys, and thank you very much for joining. Um, I want to start uh, with Nikhil uh, Sagdev. He's a managing director at Insight Partners. Nikhil, why don't you get the conversation started? and tell us about uh, what do you see as the top trends in AI and machine learning in the industry? Yeah, I think, um, you know, I think like many of you in this audience, um, uh, we, we've been studying ML for a long time, and it's really over the last four quarters that um, AI and Gen AI has become, I think, the dominant focus um, as, as we think about what's coming next um, in software development and computing. Um, I think. Banking and finance are massive sectors. Um, I think about you know AI and ML as impacting the sector in two ways. You know, one um, is on the top line with revenue, just um, helping helping banks and financial institutions deliver better products in more unique ways and engage the customer um, in different ways that drive more revenue. And then the second, and if you look at a typical bank, but you know, 26% to a third uh, of the cost structure is people cost. And I think that AI and ML has a, a unique um, uh, opportunity to really drive uh, more efficiency in the organization of, of banks and financial institutions. And I think for banks in particular, that's really important. You know, banks operate at um, pretty thin, you know, net margins and they're levered. And so even small movements, um, in inefficiencies can actually magnify the impact on, on equity value. Um, Thank you, Nikhil. Well, that's a good introduction. What we're gonna do is after each one of them speak and introduce what's going on, I will allow two or three questions from the audience and then we'll move along the speakers. Uh, if anybody has any questions for, or at the end we can you know ask questions to anyone, but if anyone, anybody has a specific question for Nikhil on what he just said, feel free to ask. Okay, we'll move forward with uh, Ben. Ben, would you like to tell us what's your perspective on the top trends in AI and machine learning and banking? Yeah, sure. Um, I think the biggest one for me is actually tooling. Um, it doesn't get a lot of play in the press, I think, because it's not ChatGPT. But um, what, what I think is exciting about it is if you think about what a machine learning engineer does day in, day out, it's everything from feature engineering to model training, mm -hmm. hyperparameter tuning, deployment, um, even systems like feature stores, online serving, all that kind of stuff, mm -hmm. um, all of those are like sort of becoming commoditized. So it used to be that you would have to build it yourself in-house, like we have all of those mm -hmm. systems in-house now. Um, and, and you sort of don't have to do that anymore. And so I think there's a sort of, I don't know if outsourcing is kind of the right word, but mm -hmm. um, like there's sort of a question of, is our competitive advantage building a feature store 
or is it taking advantage of the data we have and offering something that is hard for you know new market entrants to reproduce? Mm -hmm. um, so I think you probably see that most clearly with cloud providers. Um, like you know, SageMaker has been around for a while, but you're starting to see it with startups also with offering a feature store and saying you don't need to worry about um, you know being able to collect this data and serve it in a way that allows model training, um, which is you know it's a hard engineering problem. It's not one I would try to spend my time solving, um, which is actually really nice for the ML engineers because then they're getting you know to focus on what they're best at, which is probably not building a feature store. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, I'm um, I'm pretty excited about that and encouraged, and I expect it'll continue. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, any questions for Ben? <coughs> Maybe we'll ask you a question now. I'll ask you a question to get the conversation going. So you work in the checking on the checking side of uh, Square Business. Could you give us an example, a real life example on these applications? Uh, just any any project that you're working on. If there's anything that that in particular that you do in your day job that yeah, you're sure. driving forward. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I can speak about it at a high level, not. Too detailed, so I'm of course, the, the engine lead for checking, and then another team that's kind of not announced just yet. But um, I think one of the biggest things we in almost any fintech faces is fake account attacks. So someone creates a bunch of fake accounts, they purport to be a legitimate user, um, and then they basically defraud you in some way. And so if they can do that at scale, like you're really toast. Mm -hmm. um, so that is actually one of the trickiest things because these fraudsters are very, very clever. Um, it's pretty easy to look at an engineering design or machine learning engineering design and say, yeah, this looks safe, um, and be completely wrong about it. And you only have to be wrong in one way to get defrauded out of a lot. Mm -hmm. um, so that is one of the trickiest things to kind of defend against, especially when um, fraudsters realize, OK, there will be a huge payoff if I can just purport to be a like a legitimate merchant. So I will actually take payments. I will actually submit an SSN. I will actually do all of these things um, for that payoff at the end. Um, and that's, that's really hard to sort of mitigate. Um, I don't know if folks have sort of great solutions just yet, but it's definitely something that's top of mind. Yeah. Thank you. Any questions from the audience at this moment? Yes, sir. Uh, here, you can use my mic. Thanks. Uh, ben, you mentioned uh, a lot of tooling being coming, becoming commoditized at this point. What are areas in your team's workflows where uh, there, there isn't commoditization, where there may be gaps? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. I mean, I think the more general question that maybe you're getting at is like, like, what are the things that people should be spending their time on as opposed to like trying to rebuild something that AWS or GCP will do better? Um, and, and I think the answer there sort of depends by business. Um, like, what is your competitive advantage? Do you have a moat? Is there something that you can actually capitalize on that makes it harder for other people to? Um, so probably can't delve too deeply into Square specifically, but you can imagine there are ones for us that like make sense, um, both on the data side and on the merchant side. Um, so that's like a very high level thought about how um, how to sort of allocate or like sort of allocate the resources and time you have available. Yeah. Evan, you didn't tell us where you're joining us from. Uh, from uh, Evan Kelsey from Galileo. Thank you. Thank you. So next we have, ja, I'm going to try to pronounce this correctly, Jaida. Jaida, that's right. Uh, Puratunda. Great. Right. She's a senior. The first, uh, yeah, bonus points for you. Yes, thank you. <laughs> She's a senior data scientist manager for core operations at Fitch Ratings. Gigita, you have the floor. I think some of the points you mentioned, Ben, is very, very relevant. And I think coming from a very core data science background, one challenge I always had is that okay, I have this you know prototype that I'm building. I know the solution works. What now? How do I you know convince like my MLE team, my business side that all these tools are actually required to make this end-to-end -end pipeline implementation that really drives value, not necessarily only like you know, deploying uh, a model, a gen AI model like say Flan T5. Like I tested it, great. Now what do I do with it? How do I actually test on real data set? So some of these blocks and modules that have come together so seamlessly these days, like take an example of a vector database. If you would have had to build a big vector database by yourself or your team, that would have taken you like so much time, expertise, outside consult like consultants' expertise to kind of build that in-house. But now you can just start uh, like using something that's open source like Chroma or Viviate, see if that makes sense for your business, and then go and pitch a solution to your uh, to your business, saying that okay, maybe we can get a a uh, big business license with something like Pinecone, which is much more heavy, stronger for production-based, uh, production-grade analysis. And this end-to-end -end pipeline chaining is what is driving value, I feel, that in the current recent years. And Gen AI is just like, you know, fueling that value 
to that level or extending that value uh, to that level. So I'm very excited, uh, and I think this is a great time. Every day I wake up, there's like something new, some new technology out, and I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm just running behind and I'm just falling behind. But that's how it's supposed to go, and that's how the technology is like, you know, expanding. So very excited to be in the space right now. Very good, thank you. Any questions? So I have questions for you. Um, sure. So I know that some of you are data scientists, some of you sit on the business side of things, sales side of things. Uh, but for the audience, Gita, can you go a little bit deeper into, you, you talked about building vector databases. Mm -hmm. What products exactly are you trying to tackle? What type of assets uh, in the portfolios are, are being tackled in these vector databases precisely? Right. Like if I can give a very generic example, like. Uh Think about document understanding. It's very common across all businesses, right? Like you, like especially companies with banking and fintech, they have thousands and thousands of documents that needs to be analyzed, understood, and then there are multiple downstream tasks. Like you want to do query, you want to do summarization, you want to do topic clustering. Think about like maybe 2016 or 2017. We were like you know trying to build work to work based models starting from scratch and then running into issues like out of vocabulary words, there were like not enough models or not enough data to uh, build a realistic strength, uh, like strengthened model that will go into production and still perform and not like, you know, have a, a point four dip from your validation test scores. Mm -hmm. So that's an area where I feel embedding based, embedding based semantic searches have taken like a huge leap. I'm sure all of you have like you know had some experience with Elasticsearch. They used to do keyword based semantic search, like only keyword based, like not uh, understanding the context. Now they have also added a similar feature to that. And why so? Because you keep seeing that these are the requirements that you just cannot build again and again. Like Ben said, like from scratch, that's already there in the market, and you're just reinventing the wheel. That's gonna like you know uh, prohibit you from getting to that final end goal that you should be pursuing, which is your business KPIs. And these are just like ways and mediums to get there. So once you have a use case, you have built some of these or chained some of these uh, already available technology, how you drive value or how you create that final uh, inference is what like drives the business happy. That's what makes business happy, basically. OK, thank you. Now, are there any, any specific uh, portfolios or asset types or industries that are harder than others when working with data sets. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure FinTech falls directly there. There's like so much uh, uh, regulation around whatever we want to do and explore needs to go through like three or four layers of approval, especially if you think uh, across like ratings industry, like which ratings does uh, ratings, right, bond ratings. So we just cannot automate everything. Everything needs to be like very tight governed and regulated just to make sure that nothing is going haywire and we are just not skewing something with like a generative or LLM based output that's just hallucinating and we are just putting that in production so that doesn't work. So I think uh, we're just sitting in the middle of the most complicated data set and uh, regulated data set that's possibly out there. But yeah, I'm happy and open to learning about other industries that face the same kind of like scrutiny and governance issues. But yeah, we are going one step at a time. That's great feedback. Mikhail, did you? No, you're good. Um, Erin Stanton is next, my friend, my new friend from Jersey City. <laughs> um, Global Head of Portfolio and Trading Analytic for Client Support for Virtu Virtual Financial. Mm -hmm. You have the floor. Awesome. So when I think about the biggest trends for us right now, so we've been doing machine learning within the trading analytics space for let's say five years now, but with the evolution of generative AI, all the accessible models, all the tools, what we're, what we're most focused on right now and what I think is a trend is actually moving the skill set that my team has in ML more broadly out to others at Virtu. So when you think about your business, when I think about my own analytics business, when I think about other businesses at Virtu, there's often times where maybe we can't engage with clients with opportunities as much as we want to because of capacity, capacity with our legal team, capacity with our compliance team, capacity with our finance team, right? These kind of peripheral function jobs that haven't really had ML applied, or at least, you know, in, in, to some extent in our case, I think there's a lot of opportunity there for us to apply some of these techniques, some of these generative AI techniques especially, 
to make the people we have in those roles more efficient so that we can then potentially expand into new businesses. I think from a generative AI perspective, that's actually what I'm most excited about is with the people we have, can we, can we optimize them? Can we move some of the low risk tasks that they're doing to AI and have them focus on some of these more value add opportunities, which sometimes we have to pass on. I think that's you know a trend that we're seeing. I've heard others within the industry have also mentioned it. Question, which Go is, ahead. you know, you kind of mentioned different um, uh, functional areas and yeah. kind of work workflow automation. I think um, in product and engineering, um, what have you seen in your org around copilots and uh, the implementation of copilots and how is that going and how is that driving? Do you mean the coding copilot yes. specifically? Yes. So we are 99% uh, on prem um, at Virtu. So a lot of the uh, a lot of the co-pilot tools that exist, right, have some sort of cloud component, so we are not engaging with those. But what we, so what our current kind of experimentation includes is we are experimenting with one of the co-pilot, I can't remember the name, it's the on-prem one, basically. Tab 9? Nope. No? It okay. has a different name. Uh, so we're, we're experimenting with that. I'm not sure if that's entirely where the efficiency gain that we're gonna get. Like one of the things that we're working on right now is we've built out this suite of 70 APIs. So all of our market data, all of our models, anything you could ever want that's a data point at Virtu is accessible as an API, but that requires that you know Python. So we're going to use some of the generative AI models to hook up to those. I think we're gonna see more uh, efficiency gains through that type of work than potentially some of the co-pilot work. But I think, you know, I was just on the, a call with someone the other day who hadn't ever written a lick of Python and I was like, go ask Ch Chat GPT how to create a data frame and load a file into it and, and they were. So, you know, I think, I think there's gonna be some gains there too, but we don't have a lot of experience with it yet. Do you? Have you guys been using them? Uh, no, I, I certainly have not. But okay. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've been studying the market, so. Not at work though, but personally. Just like trying, yeah, taking it out and seeing, and that if that makes adds value, then how do you pitch to business? But that's like a very hard sell. Yeah, it is a hard sell. Thank you. Any questions for Aaron? Yes. Uh, can you state your name and where are you coming from? Hi, I'm Eero, and uh, I head the investments data science at Tiro. Euro Tiro. <laughs> so um, you mentioned earlier, and you, Erin, as well, you're discussing about you know, using uh, AI to bring efficiency. Mm -hmm. I would argue that unless the revenue side of the business is as efficient as it can be, so as it makes already as much money as it can, then it doesn't make sense to try to cut cost. It's like the put call option payoff, right? So if something costs you $100, you can save up to $100 if you make it completely efficient. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you make a similar investment on the revenue side, sky's the limit. Yeah. So it, this is mostly like a semi-philosophical. I'm curious to no, hear I, I, your I thoughts. Actually, I actually agree with you. I didn't necessarily I do too. mean efficiency <laughs> as like, okay, I have $100 of cost. My only goal is to bring it down to 80 I think you can have the same cost base or even more cost base but get meaningfully more output. Right. And I think there are like two examples yeah. in banking and financial services, which may be viewed in efficiency, but are actually also meaningful improvers to customer NPS and revenue. And think about um, automation of the loan process or KYC and AML checks. Yeah. Both things that are uh, not fully automated, um, that aren't totally efficient, but if you if you automated them, made them more efficient, made them quicker, they actually drive more customer value. Right, it's scaling, I agree. But you in particular said like, oh, you could cut down basically on human capital, right? Which is not exactly the same because the idea is you're using efficiency to scale. So basically you're talking about revenue side. It, it doesn't, it may or may not have an impact if that's the implementation of efficiency on how many people you employ, no? Uh, and ag agreed, but yeah. hopefully it does on your margins. So you could get, more revenue and 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 more profit or margins, and I think in a, a banks which are leveraged businesses, that is a, you know a, a positive outcome for the bank and probably an ROI driver for the bank. Thank yeah, and my efficiency thought was just around onboarding new clients, right? The whole when when we onboard a new specific to my business analytics client, there's a whole 
legal process that's quite extensive, right? So that's new revenue. So if I can onboard, if today it takes me, you know, I can only onboard five new clients a quarter and I can go to 10, then I'm really only looking about it as new revenue. And, and right now my revenue stream is capped based on the efficiency of the current people I have. I want to make my current people way more efficient so that I can I can go after new business. I can, you know, all those conversations, I'm sure people have had those, you have them internally where you're like, oh, isn't that a great idea? Yeah, we should explore that. Oh, we don't have time. I, I want to go after that business. Thank you. Yeah, I, I have some comments on that. Great, but this is a great segue <laughs> because you're next, uh, Harry. So, so Harry, you are the data architect technology head of the Federal Reserve Bank in New York City. Um, not, not exactly. I'm I'm co-chair of the AI. Okay. Uh, so even even table. even a stronger so, title you got. So so, yeah. so well, we don't want to step on any toes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and and before I go further, I have a similar thing to say. The analyst said that everything I say represents my thoughts and ideas, and not gotcha. policy of the Federal Reserve. You're, you're exempt. It's fine. No so judgment. We're very uh, risk adverse, as you can imagine. Of course. <laughs> and. Uh, and I also work as uh, part of the data architecture team in New York implementing, right now we're trying to put together uh, data catalogs and the data mesh that Ellen was talking about and get that into the cloud. So I wear two hats there. But uh, one of the things that I want, I forget what question I was answering now because of all the introductions. But basically, oh, I know, it had to do with the, uh, what we were talking about, about the trade-off between the efficiencies of AI and capital and things like that. Well, we don't really worry about that at the Federal Reserve because we uh, aren't running a profit organization. We're just trying to be more efficient in what we do and try to be more thorough in what we do. And uh, one, of our, one of the thoughts is, just to jump right into it with the data catalog, is I don't know how many people have worked with various data catalogs. There's a few vendors out there. I don't necessarily want to say which one we're working on because I may get spanked if I do that. But um, in any case, they're all more or less hard to use. They re it requires some training. And our idea is so uh, business users can come in and search through the data and extract what they need to do their business, even if it's just to put it into an Excel sheet or if they're a Python programmer. Uh, they could use it into a data frame, but a way of you know accessing the data. So we would like to use generative AI so they could essentially put a prompt in saying what they want to do, and then the AI would be able to locate in the data catalog the data that they're looking for, and furthermore generate the SQL query to bring the data out to them. So if they just want to put it into their Excel sheet, it just goes into their Excel sheet. If they want to use it in Python, it just goes into a data frame. And it could even set them up with basically a templated uh, set where, okay, now you've got Python and a data frame and also runs some data visualization and other just data exploration uh, components that are part of Python or, or Pandas. And uh, then they can go from there. Mm -hmm. And that would be a huge productivity increase for people. So that's like the way we see AI being used one way. Another way is that we um, collect from all the banks as part of our supervision operations all the memos that they will give us, all the information that they can, including some things which would be embarrassing or cause damage if it was leaked into the public. So we have a, a, a we're worried about security, we're worried about encryption, we're worried about lots of things, and consequently, it's very hard to get access to the entire corpus to train models. So that's, you know, in the old days, when they weren't training models, when they were just telling programmers what they wanted to do, you wouldn't have to expose the entire corpus. You could just give a few samples. So one of the trends at the Fed is, uh, is people, in, me and, and who work for me, trying to convince the security people that the data scientists need access to a large amount of data to be able to train models. And they don't quite get that at first. So uh, hopefully we're succeeding. And part of this whole data catalog, data mesh operation will enable that. And there are also technologies which may help as well in terms of uh, encryptions that they will you know, be satisfied with. So uh, that's one trend. Another trend is this tremendous interest 
in generative AI, as you can imagine. Mm -hmm. So people that never thought of using AI before and now want to use it right away. And of course, we, our security people ref reflexively said, no, you can't, as most places have. And they say, why not? So part of my job is trying to convince our security. In fact, later on this afternoon, I'm going to give a, a talk on this at our town hall to permit the use under certain guidelines. Mm -hmm. So we feel that if they're working with public data, and the perfect use case would be we have an outward-facing website, which people go to. It's, uh, I think it's, uh, I'm not actually sure. But you can look it up, because we use the internal one. But it's something .gov by frbny.gov or something like that, or federalreserve.gov. Anyway, you go to it, and it has all kinds of information about the economy and graphs and all these other things. We have uh, a large team which is working around the clock to put this thing together. And one of the problems they have is translating information that's in The Economist's research reports into material that could be put into the, uh, into the website. And they've experimented using ChatGPT you know, off the shelf. And it does a great job if you give it the right prompt to explain for social media, high school level, the following economic thing. And if you find any economic terms, ex expand their meaning out as well. And it, it does the job. They'd love to be able to use it. So we have to develop policies which would mm -hmm. permit that, but not, as I think someone jokingly said over lunch, chat GPT, what should we do with the interest rate? You know? <laughs> <laughs> so. <laughs> Thank you, Harry. So I think we're, we're talking about trends driving the future. I think Gen AI is one of those that it will be a crime not to talk about it today, right? Mm -hmm. uh, because it's just so pervasive in the industry right now. Everybody wants to talk about it. Does anybody has any questions? If not, I do have a question about Gen AI. What, and that specifically, um, drive, driving trend, what are you seeing in your, in your companies? Everyone, we were talking about it a few minutes ago about some of the things that you're doing, that you're actually putting some personnel just focus on Gen AI for some purposes. Can you, can you tell us a little bit more about what you're doing there? Sure, so uh, by personnel, our interns, our interns yeah. <laughs> who started on Monday, if you're watching interns, hi. Um, so we're basically throwing our interns. We've, we've consolidated a, a project list, I think, of 15 projects across the entire firm that people just threw out ideas for, and we just are chucking the interns at them to see what's possible. So, you know, examples I'd mentioned before, can we use the ChatGPT plugin to connect to our API suite? Can we use some of the on-prem um, models that exist because we're, you know, have very confidential data. So can we use some of the on-prem models to talk to our company wiki? We're crazy about documentation when it comes to our company wiki. If, if, you know, if it's not on what we call the loop, then you can't talk about it. So everything is on the loop. So how can we optimize finding stuff like that? The amount of times you're like, oh, I know that's on the loop, but crud, where is it? So we're doing that. We're experimenting with a ton of the different versions. There's, you know, we're just anything that's an idea we're, we're chucking. And, and, and the point of this is that at the end of the summer, we're hoping to have, you know, two or three projects that we think are realistic, that have value, that have meaning that we're going to, you know, invest in. And then some of these other ones where we're like, well, that was interesting, but, you know, not worth our time right now. We'll, we'll trickle off. I see. At what stage, um, let's say if you have to define the stage of maturity of Gen AI in your companies, one being terrible and 10 being everybody's using it. How about what? we start with new instead of terrible? New, okay. <laughs> yes. What, no. What's the maturity level that you see in your companies um, with Gen AI? Harry, any, any thoughts? Yeah, we're, we're definitely new. Uh, we're, we're particularly new in understanding what has to be done in terms of guidance, in terms of what the protocols are in terms of um, you know, per permission to use it because we don't want people releasing confidential information into, into these devices, our, our clouds. We don't want uh, people making uh, important decisions based on the information they get. I don't know if everyone heard the news story about a lawyer that went to court and you know, it generated uh, ChatGPT generated all these fictitious cases that looked real. It's a fantastic. And then he followed up and yeah. asked, and he's like, "Are oh. you sure these are real?" And yeah. ChatGPT was like, "Yup." I was like, "Could you not like follow up in Google rather than like ChatGPT who gave you the wrong answers?" Good. But yeah. Yeah, and uh, although it's not a problem 
Recently, I, I'm sure the other news story was the, the reporter that ChatGPT fell in love with, and <laughs> and uh, oh, you have a yeah, question. You want to sir. avoid those things. We have a question right here. <laughs> yes. So. Sure. Uh, specifically to Nikhil, but all of you may chime in. Uh, you know, when we have these evolutions or revolutions in technology, it's usually the, a new business model that wins. It's not peppering the, the new technology on existing business models. So I'm just challenging. What What do you guys think will be the big breakthrough or the big thing that none of us right now are thinking about? Well, I think it's been mentioned, but I'd like to emphasize it. Uh, several of our speakers talked about the vector databases and things like that, which may be uh, not familiar to people. But basically, there's two things going on there that are going to be, I think, major uh, business changing uh, events. One is that these vector databases allow you to use something similar or ChatGPT to not make the mistake that it made with those legal briefs. For example, if you combined it with a Nexus database, and you had it search relevant cases and then looked at those cases and used that as the input to the answer, it would have given some really good answers. Similarly, at the Fed, we could have it search through supervision documents mm -hmm. and then put that into the context, which is like the prompt of ChatGPT, and have a more informed uh, answer to like what banks are exposed to flood risk, things like that. And it could just go through and, and come back with the information. What? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> so that's one one big thing, and it, and there's lots of different ways of of, achie of achieving that. So the the other thing is that a lot of things that took people's time in the past in terms of generating memos or generating plans or a agendas or illustrations. There's all the uh, you know, image creating capabilities. I was just at a meeting the other day where they were looking at some products that would help them with their graphics. So I think it's going to speed those things up as well. Thank you, Eddie. Other thoughts to kill? Yes, we we are good on time. We're about five more minutes. Yeah, that, that's great. I think you were asking about what are going to be some of the new areas. I kind of interpreted the question as what are some of the new areas where, um, let's say, we are looking at investments or we're seeing innovation um, and equity value creation in this ecosystem. And I, there are four segments that we're focused on. Um, uh, one is just the foundational LLMs. And some of those are standalone companies like OpenAI. Some of them are um, uh, developed by the strategics. Um, you know, the second is vertical specific LLMs. And we haven't talked about it as much in this conversation, but I actually think one of the interesting areas um, that may drive value in uh, banking and finance is, are there opportunities um, for large firms in banking and finance to develop their own vertical specific LLMs? And I'm thinking of Bloomberg as an example. Or index mm -hmm. GPT, JP Morgan's. Y yep. Yeah. Um, and then I think two other areas of the stack we're focused on, um, the tooling. And, and a lot of my um, uh, panel panelists mm -hmm. uh, here, I would actually love to learn more about where you think are going to be the big durable um, kind of value creators within the, the tooling. And you talked about mm -hmm. vector databases. Um, and then the last part of the stack, which kind of sits on top, is the application layer. And I think both vertical and horizontal. Vertical would be, you know, healthcare finance. Horizontal would be coding, design, uh, marketing. You know, imagine all the different vertical categories we have in software. I think there's an opportunity for one or two players that are AI native to emerge as leaders in all of those different application categories. Mm. I would like to add one very interesting point about the vertical LLMs that you mentioned. Think, think about the time like when we were like actually fine tuning Bird or Bird based models. That were not I that. I still love Bird. I, I still <laughs> I love it, but it was not that far away, right? It was like maybe a couple of like two or three months back. But now the goal is like, how can you not spend so much resources? fine tuning on like maybe a very tiny sample data set which sometimes is a challenge like getting very clean uh, ve vertical or business specific data set mm -hmm. rather use something like an uh, open source llm let's take an example of maybe flanty 5 double xl models Th those are like completely open source you can host them in your system like they are not like uh, open to any kind of risk or governance issues but then use something like dsp like a directional stimulus prompting in 
creating that vertical model for your business use case. So you are not giving it like a standard prompt or like a standard uh, uh, question that, oh, find me the answer. But you are building maybe some a small model like a T5 or like maybe even a distal bird training and finding some specific context-based use keywords mm -hmm. and then feed that as like an instruction and prompt in the large language model that you cannot maybe fine tune as of yet or even do not have the resources and maybe even prompting gets you the best answer so why do you like you know kind of go towards that so even in my eyes that's that's also a vertical model like not specifically or not necessarily big as Bloomberg GPT or uh, index GPT but it's still serving the purpose of the particular particular financial vertical that you are trying to solve the challenges and the problems for so I definitely think that's like a uh, not a change in the business model, but a change in how you get to the, the or you solve the solve the problems that you have at hand. Yeah, the approach definitely. I I agree with what Jada said. Uh, all the interest that I see, other than like the corporate communications and uh, website use, will require vertical uh, LLMs. Whether you get that by taking one that's generic and attaching a lot of other things to it like vector databases like like special prompts and all these things but you have to have a pipeline Absolutely. probably including a human in the loop as well before it goes to the customers or to uh, as far as training or fine-tuning them I think that's going to certainly be coming uh, down the road I think right now it's too expensive uh, for most but maybe not when they really see what the economic gain is for, for doing that. The prices are also going to go down for fine tuning. People are coming out with open source models that can be fine tuned for much less than what the commercial uh, companies say they cost. I think they want to create an apparent moat when it really doesn't exist. And I think, I would predict that within several years it will be commonplace. Hmm. Interesting. I'll allow one or two more questions. We're coming at the top and to the end. Any questions? Yes. Uh, hi everyone, I'm RT and I'm here with the Department of Defense. Um, I had a question for Harry. Um, when, like, I feel like there's like a conversation about like build it versus buy it, and especially when it comes to security, like you were saying, and you're going to have a talk later. Like, I guess, what is your pitch, or how do you approach those conversations when you talk about, um, I guess, sensitive data and being in the public sector? Like, we're not a business that's focused on the bottom line, but mm -hmm. like the security guys are infamously very cagey and risk averse. <laughs> right. That's such a good question. <laughs> so, so, ready for the answer. <laughs> well, it's, a, it's a very deep question, and that's why I don't think you'll see the Department of Defense or the Federal Reserve becoming OpenAI subscribers very soon and putting our data into it, but we might experiment, right? So we definitely need to have things in-house. Now, to buy or to build, I think it's always going to be a little bit of each. We'd love it if we could just buy something that works, but inevitably we won't get that because we have our own specialized needs, as I know the Department of Defense does, and most other companies that have any kind of sensitive data or data that is not the typical use. I mean, I would say the major source of AI still today is in marketing and advertising, and there probably will be some out-of-the-box products for that. But when you get into things like defense, like I'm, I'm sure, uh, I mean, it doesn't take a lot of imagination to know that you guys probably are looking at some generative AI for assessing battleground data and coming up with a fast response strategically. And I would imagine that people, well, you may have a defense contractor that's building that. It's very possible. Or you may do it in yourself, or you may do it through DARPA or a combination of things. But it's going to be something that's built to your needs one way or another. And I think that's also true for the Federal Reserve, but when you come to more generic things like production lines, analytical environments, then buy for sure. How about someone, I see nodding, but someone should uh, speak on this too. I think we got room for one more question. Okay, well, all good things must come to an end, right? And uh, thank you very much for joining us, everyone. Thank you for coming, guys. And um, I think this is this is it. This is the end. If you if you have any more questions for the panelists, feel free to approach them afterwards. And now I turn it over to Anna, where I do not know where she's at. But 
Thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you to you too, Jonathan, for moderating it so nicely. Thank you.